Hello and welcome to the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. My name is Claudia Rizzini. I'm the executive director of the fellowship program. The Institute is one of the world's leading centers for interdisciplinary exploration. We bring, we bring students, scholars, artists, and practitioners together to pursue curiosity driven research, expand human understanding, and grapple with questions that demand insights from across disciplines. You can be a part of this vibrant community by attending public programs such as this one, visiting virtual exhibitions, or pursuing the special collections held at the Schlesinger Library. To learn more, you can visit rackley.harvard.edu and sign up to receive more information on news and events. We'll begin the program with a presentation by Ariella Gross. After the presentation, the speaker will respond to questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any time throughout the program. We ask that you keep your questions brief to allow us to address as many as possible in the time that we have together. It is my pleasure to introduce Joy Foundation Fellow, Ariella J. Gross. Professor Gross is the John B. and Alice R. Sharp Professor of Law and History at the University of Southern California and co-director of the USC Center for Law, History and Culture. A premier legal historian, she has thought deeply and written with great insight about slavery and race over the course of her career. Professor Gross is the author of three books, including Double Character, Slavery and Mastery in the Antebellum Southern Courtroom, which looks at racist ideology in the law through a study of the day-to-day -day trials involving enslaved people in the marketplace. Her second book, What Blood Won't Tell, A History of Race on Trials in America, is a history of race and racism through trials of racial identity in which courts decided who was black, white, or Indian. The book won numerous prizes, including, including the Lillian Smith Book Award for the best book on the history of the South and the struggle for, ju for racial justice, and the J. Willard Hearst Book Prize from the Law and Society Association for the best book on socio-legal history. Her most recent book, Becoming Free, Becoming Black, Race, Freedom and Law in Cuba, Virginia and Louisiana, co-authored co with Alejandro de la Fuente, a professor here at Harvard, also won several prizes, including the Order of the Coif Award for the best book on law in 2020. The book, based on extensive archival research in three locations and across four centuries, argues that the law of freedom, not slavery, established the meaning of blackness in law and emphasizes the initiatives of enslaved people themselves in shaping the law. While at Rackley, Professor Gross is working on a new book project, The Time of Slavery, History, Memory, Politics and the Constitution which will distill her deep knowledge of how slavery shaped constitutional law, memory, and our political present. As debates of, about uh, reparations, affirmative action, and other forms of redress reverberate throughout our society, this book will aim to address how the memory of slavery is alive today. Working in a truly interdisciplinary fashion, Professor Gross will move beyond her own disciplines of law and history to encompass constitutional law, critical race theory, comparative politics, race and American political development, a sociology of social movements and collective memory. Professor Gross has published articles on the law and politics of race and the memory of slavery in the United States and France, as well as on the grassroots history of co colorblind conservatism. She has received fellowship from the American Council of the Learned Societies, the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University, the Huntington Library, the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Professor Gross received her PhD in history and her JD from, this, from Stanford University. It is my great pleasure to give the virtual floor to Ariella J. Gross. Thank you so much to Claudia for the kind introduction. I want to begin with some acknowledgments. Um, I am grateful to the staff of the Radcliffe Institute and the Harvard Facilities Department for everything they do to support our research here. Thank you as well to my fellow fellows, especially the organizers of the MIG Research Collaboration. I've learned so much from all of you. 
And a special thanks to my Radcliffe research partners, Darlene Uzuigwe and Jalen Coughlin, and my USC Law School research assistant, Caleb Downs, who have tracked down and read everything from Union soldiers letters to Supreme Court briefs to uh, Tucker Carlson videos. I also want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you, well, from the ether, but also from the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts people, and I want to honor the Massachusetts tribe past and present. Finally, I'm speaking to you from a university that was directly complicit in slavery and the slave trade from its beginnings, and even after slavery ended here, supported research that perpetuated racism and justified enslavement. And I want to thank Dean Tamiko Brown Nagan and other members of the Presidential Initiative on the Legacy of Slavery at Harvard and the Harvard students uh, over the last 15 years who've done the work to tell this history and begin the process of repair. And this acknowledgement of the relationship between the work that we're privileged to do and the forced labor that helped build this institution is especially fitting for my talk today. Um, in the books I've written, uh, well, I should say this project uh, that I'll talk about today is both an extension and, uh, and, and a departure from uh, my previous work. So uh, in the books I've written, I've tried to show the origins of racial regimes in the law, and in particular, the way that the day-to-day -day operation of law through local trials and regulation of people's daily lives, especially people who lived on the borders between slavery and freedom or between black and white, helped to establish the equation between whiteness and citizenship that's had lasting legacies to this day. I've also tried to show that this link between whiteness and citizenship in the law was forged during the age of revolution. At the very moment, freedom, equality, and democracy, at least in theory, were being extended to all white men. It was at that historical moment that the US Constitution was drafted and ratified, not only protecting, but enabling the unprecedented growth of plantation slavery in the US, politically, structurally, and economically, by men who, like most white people at that time, believed that even if slavery was wrong, Black people could not live side by side with white people as citizens, but once free, should be deported, or in the language of the day, removed. So my new book, uh, still at the early stages, is about the continuing struggles over the meaning of the Constitution and the way the stories that we have told about slavery and freedom have shaped and continue to shape uh, the Constitution. It's not only about history, uh, but about memory, and that's really a, a departure from uh, my previous books. And I'm truly indebted to the many scholars who've done this work. My contribution, I hope, will be to show how the same things at stake in cultural battles are also playing out in constitutional politics and law with devastating consequences for the present and future of citizenship and equality for all. So I'm gonna to try to give an overview of the book in the time I have uh, from reconstruction and the backlash to reconstruction to the second reconstruction 100 years later and the backlash that we are living through today. I'm gonna to spend some time in the immediate aftermath to emancipation because stories about slavery and freedom start being told as soon as the civil war ends. So this is the Emancipation Memorial in uh, Lincoln Park on Capitol Hill. And as you can see, it depicts President Abraham Lincoln with a black man kneeling at his feet, bare chested, broken shackles on his wrists. The memorial has an unusual history. Uh, Charlotte Scott, who is a freed woman in Marietta, Ohio, uh, pictured up her left, donated the first $5 of her wages to build the, the, a memorial to President Lincoln shortly after his assassination. The funds end up in the hands of the president of the Western Sanitary Commission, William Greenleaf Elliott, pictured upper right. Uh, and in 1871, Elliott asks Thomas Ball to cast the monument, and Ball models it somewhat on Archer Alexander, pictured in the bottom right. 
Alexander's story suggests the problem of portraying Lincoln as the great emancipator. Eliot, I'm sorry, uh, Alexander freed himself. He um, uh, escaped bondage in Missouri in 1863, even though Missouri was not covered by the Emancipation Proclamation. He found refuge with Eliot, who was not an abolitionist, but someone who hoped slavery would die out gradually and that Black people would be removed to Liberia. Um, Alexander uh, petitioned a U Union Army general for his freedom papers, but the general refused uh, and just gave him a temporary permit to live with Eliot uh, because, again, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't cover Missouri. So Alexander owed his freedom not to President Lincoln, but to his own courage and enterprise uh, with the help of a slightly reluctant white ally. Um, Alexander's escape during the Civil War was part of a movement of nearly half a million Black people who seized their own freedom during the Civil War, most of them fleeing to Union Army lines where they became known as contraband, property belonging to disloyal rebels that could therefore be commandeered by the Army. Contraband camps were places of illness and death but they were also places where Black people organized politically and claimed citizenship. And out of them came 200,000 Black Union soldiers who turned the tide of victory in the Civil War and died at double the rates of white soldiers. And the debate over who freed the slaves began almost as soon as the last shot was fired. In the summer of 1865, the well-known Black abolitionist Martin Delaney, who was a major in the Union Army, spoke before a crowd of freed people in South Carolina and said, we would not have become free had we not armed ourselves and fought for our independence. Edward Stover, a white uh, officer who was standing by, immediately stood up to correct him saying, oh, President Lincoln, declared the colored race free. Um, so the memorial was dedicated, the Emancipation Memorial was dedicated in 1876 in front of 25,000 people with an oration by another famed uh, abolitionist, Frederick Douglass. And although he extolled, quote, the exalted character and great works of the first martyr president, he also declared that Lincoln was, quote, the white man's president, entirely devoted to the welfare of white men. Douglas said Lincoln should be honored because, quote, though the union was more to him than our freedom and our future, we did, we saw ourselves gradually lifted from the depths of slavery to the heights of liberty and manhood. And it's not in the written oration, uh, but according to an observer, Douglas also commented that the kneeling pose of the statue did not accord with the image of liberty and manhood. Fast forward to summer of 2020 at the peak of Black Lives Matter protests around the world, protesters toppled monuments to enslavers and even uh, challenged a memorial to emancipation that tells the slavery to freedom story in a way that demeans Black people. And as a Harvard student who was protesting in Lincoln Park put it, the memorial embodies white supremacy and the disempowerment of Black people. Um, you can see the chain link fence there that was due to a Trump uh, executive order protecting monuments. So uh, the monument in Lincoln Park still stands, although a replica in Boston was removed. Let me pause here to reiterate, the memorial suggests that slavery ended because of a white savior, although Archer Alexander's story shows that many Black people seized freedom for themselves. Some white people already portrayed the Civil War as a debt paid by white people to Black people, um, implying that nothing else was owed after 1865. And it's this slavery to freedom story that I want to uh, trace through our history. Um, 
Now for the Constitution, if you walk from Lincoln Park down East Capitol Street to the West, it leads in less than a mile to the US Capitol. And in 1865, the Supreme Court was still meeting in the old Senate chamber of the Capitol building, which uh, was built in part by enslaved laborers. By 1876, when the memorial was dedicated, three amendments had been added to the Constitution. Uh, the 13th abolished slavery, the 14th established US citizenship and the equal protection of the laws, and the 15th prohibited governments from denying men the, men <laughs> the right to vote on the basis of race. Now, there was also during Reconstruction a level of Black political power that's hard to remember today. Free people claimed rights by leaving plantations and taking to the roads, refusing to yield public space to white people, reuniting families, organizing their own labor, forming independent churches and fraternal organizations, and engaging in mass politics, mass meetings, petitions, Republican Party politics, protests, state constitutional conventions, voting and running for office. In 1871 alone, more than 300 Black men are elected to state legislatures, and in more than 200 counties of the former Confederacy, uh, there was a, a Black man in local office. In 80 of the counties, there were more than three uh, sheriffs, county commissioners, registrars, magistrates, as well as several U.S. Congress people and one U.S. Senator, Hiram Revels. In reaction to rising Black political power, a wave of racist violence swept the Southern states. The Ku Klux Klan formed in 1866, targeted active Republicans, staging a spree of terrorism in the run-up to the 1868 presidential election. Nearly 800 people, most Black, were killed in Louisiana alone in the two months before the election, and Klan terrorism brought down Republican state governments in Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina. Congress acted in 1870-71 to 71 to enforce the 15th Amendment against this racist terrorism by passing the Civil Rights Acts of 1870 and 71, known as the Enforcement or Force Acts. They authorized the use of the U.S. military against the Klan and made interference with an individual's exercise of his right to vote a federal crime. And the Force Acts were effective. Some governors did call in federal troops. U.S. Marshals arrested thousands of Klansmen. And in response, uh, white supremacists pioneered new tactics after 1872. The masks came off. Violent so-called race riots began to take place in Republican strongholds. And that term, riot, was used as a way of blaming Black people. Um, we see this through the 20th uh, century. But in fact, these were usually wholesale massacres. And the largest of these massacres took place at the Grant Parish Courthouse in Colfax, Louisiana, in April of 1873. Black Republicans had been standing guard at the courthouse to protect the newly elected Republican government in a contested local election. Hundreds of white men, among them one named William Cruikshank, massacred at least 100 Black men that day, many of them waving white flags in surrender in the face of overwhelming firepower, including a big cannon. Uh, U.S. attorneys are only able in a indictment that's hundreds of pages long, they're only able to indict nine men of violating the Force Acts. Eventually, three of them, including Krugshank, are convicted. He appealed to the Supreme Court, and the court decided in early 1876 to overturn the conviction on the grounds that the Reconstruction Amendments could reach only state action, uh, not the acts of private individuals. The Colfax Massacre was the direct and bloody result of enslavers 
holding furiously to their power over Black people. It was a refutation of emancipation. But by refusing to see that and seeing only innocuous private action, the court emptied the new amendments to the Constitution of efficacy and meaning, burying efforts to prosecute the forces of reaction to give tea to the 15th Amendment, and telling white people they could kill Black people with impunity. A few years later, the Supreme Court hammered home the final nail in the promise of reconstruction with the poignantly named civil rights cases. In his opinion, Justice Bradley invalidated a broad piece of uh, civil rights legislation that guaranteed equal access to public accommodations. And again, uh, Bradley interpreted the 13th and 14th Amendments very narrowly and concluded, when a man has emerged from slavery, there must be some stage in the progress of his elevation when he ceases to be the special favorite of the laws. Um, so, okay, <laughs> we have here, uh, right, this story that is embodied in both the memorial and in the Supreme Court cases uh, of the 1870s and 1880s that says slavery is in the deep past even just 17 years after its end. Only 17 years after the end of legal slavery, the Supreme Court is already impatient with Black people's claims for equal citizenship, seeing them as demands to be the special favorite of the laws. The important story, they say, is, is freedom. And freedom doesn't necessarily mean citizenship or equal rights, just the minimal right to own oneself. Um, this story has a long life and it leads to a constricted vision of black citizenship. So what happens after reconstruction? Um, well, it's in the late 19th and early 20th century that we get some of the really enduring myths about slavery and the Civil War. And they don't just come from the South. Both Northerners and Southerners reunite in the post-Reconstruction period in a joint commitment to white supremacy, in part by burying the memory of slavery in a romantic story about the lost cause of the Confederacy, states' rights, Southern heritage, uh, Moonlight and Magnolias. Already the North had disowned slavery, forgetting that even Northern founders like Benjamin Franklin owned human beings, and that there were still enslaved people in New Jersey at the end of the Civil War. It's in the early 20th century that we see the heyday of Confederate monument building, although it's as early as 1870, uh, Frederick Douglass wrote of the nauseating flatteries of Robert E. Lee and the monuments of folly being built to Confederate leaders. Um, the film Gone with the Wind is from the 1930s, and also beginning in the 1930s was the Natchez uh, Spring Pilgrimage in uh, Natchez, Mississippi, uh, where I uh, did my research for my first book. This was a tradition started by white garden club women of opening the antebellum mansions of enslavers for so-called plantation tours each spring, and they staged tableau and Confederate pageants that included Black people represented as, quote, mammies and pickaninnies for a celebration of this white fantasy. And this image of the Natchez uh, pilgrimage uh, tableau is from 2018. So this is an ongoing and extremely successful type of white cultural memory work. And just remember that that uh, cultural memory work goes hand in hand in that period, the, the first half of the 20th century of extraordinary racial violence across the United States, lynching, racial cleansings of towns and cities, um, and of course, legal Jim Crow. Along with the lost cause myths, uh, and as, at least as pernicious, was the enormously influential condemnation of Reconstruction that's purveyed by a Northern scholar, William Archibald Dunning, and his students. Uh, Dunning was a professor of history and political science at Columbia University, uh, that's in New York. Um, <laughs> 
He, uh, he wrote about Reconstruction as a time of corruption and vice attributable to Black voting. Uh, Dunning students were even more influential and more racist uh, or more overtly and explicitly racist. And in particular, Claude Bauer's book, The Tragic Era, is a bestseller. And uh, it's cited repeatedly during the 20th century uh, by courts uh, as well as uh, politicians. Uh, he, uh, the tragic era glorified Andrew Johnson and the Ku Klux Klan. Um, the Supreme Court uh, uh, cites Bowers lamenting the radical legislation of Reconstruction, and uh, this should say referred to the Reconstruction amendments as born of the vengeful spirit that envenomed the Reconstruction era. And uh, this continues, you can find uh, these citations into the middle of the 20th century, and not only in the court, um, I've recently been reading the uh, debates in Congress over the Civil Rights Bill of 1957, where both opponents and proponents of civil rights um, raise the specter of the disastrous Reconstruction era. Hubert Humphrey in, in 1957 said, I do not like to have the American people reminded of the dark and sad days of Reconstruction. So I don't need to tell you, or I don't have time uh, to tell you the history of the civil rights movement or massive resistance, but I just wanna highlight that the extraordinary violence of this era has been largely suppressed for a cleansed memory of Martin Luther King's colorblind dream. And again, I, I use in the book, uh, Natchez, Mississippi for my example, um, in part because of, of the juxtaposition of this Moonlight and Magnolia's fantasy with extraordinary violence. Uh, the new incarnation of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1960s burned churches, bombed civil rights leaders' cars, and there were innumerable acts of whipping, kidnapping, and murder in Natchez that went unpunished. And this culminated in an episode now known as the Parchment Ordeal that was entirely repressed from white memory until very recently uh, when Black activists succeeded in getting this memorial uh, pictured here uh, below to the Parchment Ordeal in 2018. Uh, in this episode, uh, at, at a moment in 1965, when marches of hundreds of protesters down the main street in town were immediately followed by uh, marches of armed uh, Ku Klux Klan members, uh, 150 young Black protesters, uh, some as young as 14 years old, are arrested, taken by bus to the notorious state prison, Parchment Farm. They're held incommunicado for a week to 10 days, stripped naked, basically uh, tortured. Um, and, and many of them describe uh, the survivors, talk about the scars that have lasted to this day. So in the midst, of this violent struggle on the streets. The second reconstruction is also a battle in the courts and new histories of slavery and freedom that challenge the lost cause and the Dunning School helped to shape the challenge to Jim Crow, starting with black historian John Hope Franklin's 1947 From Slavery to Freedom, which built on important black scholarship uh, in particular, W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction that had been ignored by white scholars. Historians and civil rights litigators worked hand in hand. Uh, in the summer of 1952, the Supreme Court asked the litigants in Brown v. Board of Education to prepare briefs on the history surrounding the 14th Amendment. The NAACP lawyers, led by Thurgood Marshall, enlisted historians, including Franklin and the young white Southern historian C. Van Woodward, uh, to help. Woodward's research became a little book, uh, The Strange Career of Jim Crow, in which he showed the forgotten alternatives of interracial political coalitions during and after Reconstruction, suggesting that the court had helped to create racial injustice in the South after Reconstruction and could help unmake it as well. 
This version of history that recognized the transformative potential of reconstruction, as well as the violent forces arrayed against it, animated the opinions of Justice Marshall when he ascended to the court in 1967, as well as those of his colleague, uh, William Brennan. Their opinions portrayed civil rights uh, legislation and a broad interpretation of the Reconstruction Amendments as a culmination of a long 150-year struggle for Black freedom. Um, and this is really uh, a, a summed up and epitomized in a speech that Justice Marshall gave on the bicentennial of the 1787 Constitution, where he essentially said, I don't celebrate that Constitution. It was defective from the start. I celebrate the Constitution that came out of the blood, the, the, the sweat, the struggles of uh, activists and uh, uh, soldiers and uh, lawyers uh, over uh, the, the many years uh, and, and in the, during the first and the second reconstructions. Um, it's in the aftermath of the second reconstruction. Uh, in fact, it's during the beginning of the legal and cultural backlash that, uh, that we're still in, I think. Uh, but it's, it's in the 1990s in particular that we begin to see both popular representations, but um, as well as official memorialization of slavery, not only in the United States, but across the world. Uh, however, much of it falls into the model of the slavery to freedom story that I outlined earlier, leaving slavery buried in the deep past to celebrate freedom, often as the gift of a white savior. And uh, I think this story has, has uh, you know, uh, you can find it all over popular culture. There were many films in the 1990s and 2000s, just a few of them pictured here um, that represent uh, that story. Now it's taken up uh, by conservative uh, politicians, lawyers, and judges in a particular way. And you know, when I uh, came back from um, doing my research in Natchez in graduate school um, and start, went to law school, I realized that that neo-Confederate fantasy of Moonlight and Magnolias was really not the most dangerous story about the past. Um, it, it was the uh, so-called uh, colorblind constitutionalism that uh, reigned in law schools in the 1990s and, and to this day, um, which celebrates freedom and equality, acknowledges slavery it was evil, um, but pictures the 1787 Constitution as the source of these uh, timeless principles of colorblindness and equality, um, conveniently uh, uh, putting, uh, picturing slavery as merely uh, a blip, an anomaly that was uh, soon corrected. And that language actually comes from uh, the reply of President Reagan's um, Attorney General William Bradford Reynolds to Marshall's uh, bicentennial speech in 1987. Um, so they take that slavery to freedom story, in particular, um, the notion that anti-slavery is really this, you know, kind of white gift uh, to um, the former slaves and their that which pays the debt of slavery, but that's married to this. Uh, colorblind uh, principle, which then allows um, uh, conservatives to argue that slavery and affirmative action are really just parallel uh, deviations from this timeless principle. Um, and of course, this often goes together with a kind of celebration of the founders and a denial of slavery's role in the constitution, in the political system, and capitalism. Um, this cartoon is uh, 12 years old now. It's from the Tea Party, uh, but it, I would say that this is even more extreme in uh, today's rhetoric. Um, you see here 
right? The founding fathers, the giants who strode the earth, um, all men are created equal, don't you agree? Thomas Jefferson, absolutely, give or take two fifths. Um, the, the founders work tirelessly until slavery is ended. And then we jump from 1865 to 1965 because uh, slavery ends, and, uh, it's over uh, in 1865 and nothing important happens again uh, until 1965. I also want to uh, highlight some quotes from uh, the reparations uh, cases that were brought in the 1990s, a, a series of claims against uh, corporations and other institutions that built their fortunes on slavery and uh, still exist to this day. Those uh, cases were consolidated into uh, in Ray African American slave descendants in uh, the Northern District of Illinois, where they're dismissed, and uh, that's. Um, upheld by the Seventh Circuit. Um, but the opinion, uh, I think, uh, takes the same uh, approach to the history. The dark clouds following the war give way to this uh, bright future. And uh, the, the Civil War is a massive, comprehensive, and dedicated undertaking of the free to liberate the enslaved. Even the enslavers suffer great loss, but in 1865, it's over, um, the, the end. Okay, uh, so just I'll conclude with just a few remarks about uh, where we are today. Um, as, as I think you all know, we're in the midst of these uh, history wars, uh, 36 state legislatures have banned the teaching of the history of slavery and racism in the public schools. Um, and this, this uh, really started uh, a few years, well, as I tried to show it started 150 years ago, but, but the, this incarnation began with attacks on the New York Times uh, Pulitzer Prize winning 1619 project. And the attacks from both the right and the left argued against the centrality of slavery in the US founding. There were even uh, some senior white male historians uh, who identify as liberal. Um, Sean Wilenz's book, No Property in Man and interviews he gave um, uh, on the topic. Um, and, and we also have uh, on the Supreme Court justices who claim fidelity to the original public meaning of the Constitution, but suppress the role that protecting slavery played in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And happy to talk more about that in Q&A. Of course, in the leaked draft opinion uh, yesterday, we, we saw one aspect of this. Um, and, and I think we also uh, saw in that opinion um, what I think is at stake. Uh, right now, which is really uh, the promise of equality and full citizenship in the Reconstruction Amendments. Um, uh, and, and whether we can uh, transform the Constitution uh, with histories that acknowledge the 250-year struggle uh, for Black freedom um, in the face of a Supreme Court that seems to be set on undoing both the first and second reconstructions. And because I have found this week uh, quite uh, dis depressing, I wanna end um, with some words uh, that I uh, try to repeat to myself. Uh, these are from Juno Diaz. He said, radical hope is our best weapon against despair, even when despair is justifiable. It makes the survival of the end of your world possible. Um, and with that, I conclude and I want to uh, thank you all. I look forward to uh, your questions and I will turn the floor over to uh, Claudia to uh, take the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ariella, for this um, very informative talk and for ending on a, on a hopeful note. Uh, we have a lot of questions, so let's get to the first one. 
One other recommendation of the Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery Initiative is that the university erect an imposing memorial to recognize its involvement with slavery. Given your focus on the Emancipation Memorial and the toppling of monuments to white supremacy during uh, Black Lives Matters, what are your thoughts about what goals can be accomplished through our memorialization project and how a memorial might tell a story that connects the past with the present and future? Um, that's a that's a great uh, question, and um, and I think you know we have a number of different kinds of models uh, of new forms of memorialization. Um, I was very moved uh, a few years ago to visit uh, the Whitney Plantation, one of the few of the former you know labor camps in the South that. Uh, has really made the, the memorialization of enslavement uh, its centerpiece. And one of the ways it does that is with a wall of names uh, of the people who were enslaved there. Um, it's, it's an incredibly um, moving um, uh, memorial. Um, I, I've also been to the memorial uh, to the slave trade in Nantes, uh, where one uh, again in a in a rather abstract um, architectural form walk uh, we walk the planks that enslaved people might have walked uh, going onto the ships. So um, I think that there are many creative ways that people uh, that artists and architects have tried to evoke um, the the and and honor the people who lost their lives, 70 people, 70 human beings enslaved at Harvard University um, to, uh, need to be remembered. Um, but, uh, but it's not necessarily in right, the kind of form of the Emancipation Memorial. It's not necessarily in you know, figurative uh, ways. Um, I, of course, believe that the best way for my alma mater, Harvard, to uh, memorialize um, its history with slavery is with the other part of what the report promises, which is um, through concrete uh, reparations to descendant communities um, and uh, to HBCUs and, uh, and to other institutions that can further equality. Um, the next question asks, what is at stake in the terms second reconstruction? When and how did that term gain currency? Um, good. Uh, the, I actually don't know the answer to when uh, <laughs> when the the term uh, second reconstruction uh, came into uh, common use. Um, I find it um, an important um, an important idea um, because. Uh, I, I think it's important, you know, as historians of constitutional law and politics to really highlight that we have gone through um, these really transformative moments uh, when um, our society, as well as our constitution, uh, come out, uh, change forever. Um, so uh, I think that that's why, for example, uh, Eric Foner refers to the first reconstruction as the second founding, um, and, I, and I think that's valid as well. Um, but, uh, but it certainly took a second, and I think it's probably going to take a third reconstruction before we can really, um, it, you know, come close to fulfilling the, uh, the ideals and the promise of uh, citizenship and equality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the next question, does the purpose, purposeful forgetting of America's racist origins have anything to do with racial capitalism, including how the United States became an economic superpower thanks to slavery? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, I think uh, you know the the scholarship um, and the histories 
uh, of slavery that it, you know are starting to emerge that that uh, were were highlighted in the 1619 project um, are not only about the the political and legal centrality of slavery uh, from our beginnings, but also the economic centrality. And I think, you know, the, the story about Harvard that we saw showcased in the report uh, that was released last week and in the conference that was held here at Radcliffe, right, was about um, the, the incredibly uh, tight links between um, the pl uh, plantation economy and the um, the northern uh, in beginnings of industrial capitalism, right? So that important institutions like Harvard um, build wealth uh, through um, the through cotton and uh, and the trade, uh, the triangle trade of slavery, cotton, um, uh, and uh, the shipment um, between here and Europe. And so I, I think that um, it's no surprise, right, that, um, that there are people who want to um, deny not only the legal and political uh, ties to, uh, to slavery, but also the economic ones. Um, because I think we like to tell a story about capitalism, right? That is, um, that is much more about, um, you know, entrepreneurial ingenuity um, and not about forced labor. Mm -hmm. um, can you say a little bit more about originalism and how it connects to these stories about slavery and slavery and freedom? How do originalist judges suppress the history of slavery? Um, so I'll give one example um, from uh, a recent case, and, and I'm indebted here to the work of the um, historian uh, Carol Anderson, um, uh, but, uh, and, and several others. So um, in the Heller case, uh, it was a, a, a very, this is a case about uh, gun rights uh, and the Second Amendment, um, it, the, opinion focuses very closely on um, what it says is an inquiry into the original meaning of the Second Amendment right to bear arms. Um, but what it pushes to the side is the history of militias uh, in the United States, which is very much a history rooted in slavery, that, that state militias were, for, for the most part, uh, um, meant to, uh, to quell slave rebellions. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's where they come from. And that was the real concern about making sure that militias would be armed uh, is to guard against uh, slave rebellions. And so, you know, that's one example of the, the Bill of Rights um, being um, its aim being to protect slavery, but um, but that's a history that we uh, don't hear told. And I would also just add that we don't see uh, much real uh, attention to the original meaning uh, of the Reconstruction Amendments, because if we did, uh, we would have a live privileges and immunities clause in the 14th Amendment, um, but we don't. Yeah, um, there is clearly interest in the latest news about uh, Roe uh, v. Wade. So could you elaborate on the Roe v. Wade's reliance on the 14th Amendment for its foundation and how overturning Roe v. Wade reiterates the violence of reconstruction and will impact in an equal way the Black community? Um, yes, so, so um, Roe v. Wade um, was a case that followed uh, pretty soon after uh, the first case that uh, uh, protected the right of a woman to contraception, which is Griswold versus Connecticut. And uh, Roe v. Wade relied on Griswold's um, uh, 
use uh, elaboration of an idea of a right to privacy and and it wasn't it didn't leave it entirely clear uh, where uh, that right came from it talked about a number of, of different places in the Constitution it relied a lot on a on a very famous piece written by uh, uh, Louis Brandeis um, but uh, but one uh, place was in the due process clause of the 14th amendment and um and uh, of course some scholars have argued and they, people uh, tried to argue in amicus briefs to the court in the current case um that equal protection should also protect uh, a woman's right uh to choose so it's not only her right to bodily autonomy that um uh, should be free, but also um, protecting her right to full equal citizenship. Um, and I'll just note that, you know, what we see here, uh, you know, in this case, and unfortunately many others, um, is a lot of use of history in the undoing of um, the Reconstruction amendments and the first and second reconstructions. The next question, how can affirmative action policies be linked with the development of reparations policies? Um, so affirmative action is in its earliest uh, incarnations um, it, during, uh, or, or the first at least, uh, calls for some form of affirmative action, right? Of actually not just, let's just see what happens, but let's actually make an effort to um, bring uh, black people and other people who have been excluded from public life and from um, many institutions, let's make an affirmative uh, effort to bring them in. Um, it, the original calls for affirmative action very much linked this to an effort to redress the harms of Jim Crow, to, um, to repair and remedy um, uh, and reverse, uh, you know, 150 years of discrimination. Um, unfortunately, uh, in recent years, um, the kind of colorblind vision uh, that I describe on the Supreme Court has made that kind of reparative uh, ideal of affirmative action um, a non-starter in, uh, in constitutional jurisprudence. So instead, all we can do is say, oh, we're having these policies to promote diversity. Um, that 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 uh, you know a diverse classroom will benefit all students or something, um, which is a you know I I think a, a pulling away from um, the the real uh, historically grounded um, justification for policies uh, to undo uh, the harms of uh, of so many years. Yeah. Um... The next question, can you comment on the work of scholars seeking to defend a narrow view of the original meaning of the 14th Amendment? Why is the original meaning discourse of the 14th Amendment so strongly weighted to views on the right? Um, you know, uh, I think it's, it's not a surprise that, uh, that the idea of uh, giving effect to the original meaning, especially of the 1787 constitution should come from the right, uh, because um, that story, as I've tried to show, um, is one that uh, that is about, um, you know, uh, opposition, it, it fits very well with opposition to a set of, of policies that, um, that people on the right oppose. Now, 
it's actually the case that at least in academia now, quite a few constitutional scholars who uh, claim to be on the left uh, are now all in favor of the original public meaning of the Constitution and claim that they are also originalists. Um, I, uh, as a you know, as a historian, I find this a very bizarre. Um, uh, approach to constitutional law, um, but uh, b uh, you know, I actually don't think at the moment that at least in in academic circles, uh, originalism is is limited to to the right. Um, although maybe you know maybe recent cases will will make people realize um, the limitations of this approach. Yeah, I guess following up on what you just said. Um... Do you think history really makes a difference in politics and law, or are they, or are these just stories that judges and politicians use for the sake of their policy preferences? Um, so here, I think um, the last few years should really uh, uh, convince us how much history has mattered. Right? Look how how in impassioned the the fights over history have been uh, not only over monuments but over the teaching of the history and I think the the fact that um, people want to ban when people start banning books and uh, and trying to um, change school curricula you know it's because that history actually matters I think our histories are intrinsic to and collective memories right of the past are intrinsic to the creation of national identities and um, and so the question of whether we're going to um, form our identity around uh, you know the promise of uh, you know of a, to a history of ongoing struggle for freedom and uh, and the uh, promise of equal citizenship that is not yet fulfilled, or are we going to, um, you know, kind of stick with um, uh, hagiography of our, of the great men uh, who got it all right uh, 250 years ago and, um, and nothing uh, should be changed. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, that people really care about uh, those stories and they really do, um, uh, have an influence. And unfortunately, you know, I think today's um, or yesterday's draft opinion, you know, uh, shows that, right, that how much um, these, uh, these histories are shape things that are going to have real impact on, uh, on women's lives and all of our lives. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Ariela, for uh, your thoughtful presentation and your perspectives. I also want to thank the audience for their terrific questions. I hope you'll be able to join us for other Rackley virtual programs. You can find out about future programs and watch videos of past events at rackley.harvard.edu. Thank you again for joining us today and have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye.